Hey everybody, welcome. Welcome to the Automated Store Debrief. It's a, a Retail Innovation Week session that's brought to you in collaboration with PSFK. Today, we're looking at how vending, self-serve, robotic and other automated technologies are being used to enhance the customer experience in the store and beyond the store. Uh, I'm sure that you've already noticed the proliferation of Amazon Go style pick and collect uh, systems. And you may have also seen the use of robots in the store um, as, as delivery uh, services as well. So today with the help of the PSFK research team, we're gonna take a step back, look at ideas such as the pack and go and the robotic helpers, but let's look, take a kind of a, a higher level vision and think about what's happening when we look at automated store technologies. And then we're going to talk to a couple of experts to help us think about how we can activate those trends. So let's start. So to start, um, let me ask my colleagues, Scott Latchett and uh, Lauren Lyons to share their research um, so that we can have a framework to think about how we can use automation in this store. Scott, Lauren. Thank you, Piers, and thanks everyone for joining us today. My name is Scott Latchett, and I am joined by my colleague, Lauren Lyons. Hello, everybody. And we're excited to share with you some research related to the larger topic, uh, retail automation, that we are sort of focusing this whole webinar around. As Piers mentioned, we'll be looking at some of the key technologies and experiences that are being brought to life, both within the store and beyond to drive customer experience, customer convenience, and then also drive operational excellence as well. As part of the presentation today, we're gonna to take you through a number of trends that we see shaping the marketplace, both from a customer experience and operational point of view. But before we do so, wanted to take a moment and share some insights to kind of set the context here. These insights that we're going to be sharing are part of a piece of research that PSFK ran with consumers in the marketplace, general sort of demographics, 18 to 64, um, with uh, all of the kind of standard um, sort of things behind them, where we asked them a number of questions related to how they felt physical retail and automation and technology were influencing their retail experience. I think the one big, the, the first big insight we're going to share here is that um, the sort of general feeling around stores is it's a little bit meh at the moment. Um, we see that um, given the sort of shift shifts that happened during COVID, there's still an obstacle to kind of getting people in store and experience um, overall is something that's super important. We found that 71% uh, of the shoppers that we um, that we surveyed were at the most moderately, but um, less so excited generally about the types of experiences that they were seeing within the store. Um, as we take you through some of the trends, we'll see the ways that that customer experience can kind of be elevated within the context of this. Super important, just in general, technology aside, um, for retailers to be thinking about the overall experience that they're offering. Also alongside of this is, um, you know, while technology is certainly welcomed as part of that experience, what we're seeing is that there is a sort of slower adoption as part of this, where consumers are interested in the things that are familiar and add value, don't have sort of a steep learning curve or necessarily uh, require them to um, give full control to automation often. Um, and so what we're seeing is that, you know, a quarter of consumers that we um, that we spoke to see in-store technology helping them enjoy the shopping experience. And certainly, um, you know, a, a slightly larger percentage see that um, driving convenience specifically around this notion of saving time within the shopping experience. Also, um, you know, as mentioned within this, we saw that there is a little bit of hesitancy in terms of fully embracing some of these fully automated experiences, the Amazon Go 
technologies of the world that um, completely remove humans uh, from the experience, if you will. One of the benefits that we see within the context of this is that um, these automated solutions are really sort of upping that ability to bring that human level of experience back to retail where um, tasks are being uh, outsourced to technology and then that's giving staff time to actually spend more quality uh, and have higher level interactions with consumers. Um, what we've what we've seen, and I think this backs up the previous stat, is that by and large we're seeing that customers in store are either interested in um, interacting with human associates or human associates with the help of technology. Um, the lowest percentage are really sort of interesting in in, in completely removing that sort of uh, human element from uh, from the retail experience by and large. And I think this makes a lot of sense. If people are going to go in stores, they want that social personal element as a part of this for sure. And then finally, what we're seeing is, um, you know, as we look at some of these innovations within vending and unstaffed retail environments, there's an opportunity really to create new opportunities to connect with customers in new ways and in new locations and deliver some very interesting experiences. Um, you know, I think there's a there's an assumption within the marketplace that um, stores are accessible sort of across the board, but, um, you know, Shoppers still feel in certain locations that they don't have access to all the things that they need. Um, and perhaps there's an opportunity here to consider some of these maybe smaller footprint, more automated solutions in order to close that gap uh, and, and connect with consumers differently. So that leads us into the next segment where we will talk through these trends. We have eight trends that we will share with you. And within each of these, we'll discuss one of the innovations that are sort of helping shape this and bring this to life within the marketplace. So this first idea that we're looking at is what we're calling targeted displays. And really what we're seeing here is that solution providers are starting to rethink what a display piece of technology, what uh, merchandising or kiosk can do within the context of a retail environment by driving some level of personalization or recommendation within the context of this to help um, close the gap in terms of driving retail sales or delivering targeted messaging within the context of that retail environment. Um, which again has the, the ability to sort of drive that discovery moment for shoppers as well. Yeah, so first example we have up here is from luxury mattress company Sattva, and they're using Samsung's digital technology to create a really customized shopping experience for their customers within their Washington DC showroom. So this Samsung digi digital signage is actually located alongside each of the mattresses on view, and it uses behavior sensing technology to display and help guide customers on a product discovery journey. And they're able to actually demo, educate shoppers um, about each mattress's features in real time. So as customers interact with these displays, they're using analytics um, to an analyze what they're clicking on, what they're interested in, in order to then follow that up with the most relevant content based on specific needs and searches. Um, so the analytics are also delivering another piece here um, for performance insights for the store as well to help them kind of better inform future marketing campaigns as well. Yeah, and I think that last point that Lauren made is, is a big one here, which is not just in this example, but I think throughout what we're seeing is that um, as we begin to have connected displays and experiences throughout the store, there's an opportunity to really sort of dive a little bit deeper into the types of data that are being captured and use that in a variety of ways to sort of drive decision making within the context of the retail environment, everything from merchandising to, you know, again, thinking about what content is ultimately going to help um, really sort of drive the experience home for customers.
The second trend we want to talk about is what we're calling scan and personalized. And in this case, if the first trend was a little bit more passive, where the technology was was sort of deriving insights from the consumer in a, in, in a more ambient way, this is a bit more explicit in terms of how consumers are choosing to interact and engage with things like vending machines and automated point of sale services, where computer vision technology is helping to better understand shoppers and respond with a level of personalization. Again, things like recommendation play a big role within the context of this. Um, and oftentimes there's, again, a different level of interactivity here where consumers are responding to uh, additional prompts as well. There we go. So bringing this trend to life is the smart kiosk from a company named Lumini that uses AI to provide a customer skincare um, recommendations to customers. And so partnering with Lulu Lab, which is an AI based beauty startup, uh, Lumini is a skin analysis kiosk and they're using a smart mirror backed by AI to diagnose skin conditions and provide that tailored recommendation as a second step. So to get that custom skin diagnosis, users scan their face by taking a photo via the smart mirror. Lumini then applies distance adjusting technology for an automatic face rec recognition. And this all happens within about 10 seconds. Lumini is able to use this ambient environment correction technology. Um, so things like external lighting can be um, helpful here too and analyzed to provide this accurate reading of each user's skin, um, even if they have makeup on. So user skin is analyzed in terms of a few different um, criteria, pores, redness, acne, um, even moisture balance, and accuracy is at least 90%. Um, based on the deep learning algorithm that is being used by Lulu Lab here. Yeah, and I think what's what's great here is is a couple of things. I mean, obviously the personalization element here um, at a very sort of high high level in terms of that level of diagnosis and analytics that sort of is powering this. But then also, I think for something like this, you've got an opportunity to really drive that sort of brand or retail loyalty within the context of, of this, you know that by coming and interacting in this type of uh, type of context that you're getting a lot more um, sort of personalization that is something that can be added to over time. And I think this ultimately, the sort of value add interaction is really important as we consider ways to kind of um, create these long-term relationships with customers today. Another interesting way that we're seeing these technologies play a role within the retail environment was, is within the sampling occasion. And again, I think what we saw was during COVID, sampling at places like Costco or at grocery stores had kind of had to take a backseat specifically for safety reasons. And um, while some of these solutions had been in the market sort of pre-COVID, there was a need to kind of rethink the way that these sampling occasions would take place. And so here, what we're ultimately seeing is um, self-serve kiosks and vending machines that are able to um, register intent through uh, a customer. So things like a loyalty card or entering an email for potential follow-up. Um, and then ultimately dispense a free trial as a part of that experience. And again, these can be standalone experiences outside of retail, or certainly as we think about multi-brand retail experiences, um, we can see these um, taking shape within that as well. So just a really um, interesting way to kind of have a high level interaction from a brand point of view. And so one vendor that's helping companies to engage with consumers through this kind of in-aisle um, sampling example is Freeosk. So Freeosk kiosks are digitally activated through either a mobile device or a lo loyalty card if you are shopping within a Sam's Club. So when using the Freeosk app, customers just simply scan a unique code at the kiosk and they receive a weekly free sample. And so these, the selections updated each week, um, product sample kiosks feature a rotating roster from number of CPG companies that they've um, partnered with, such as like Tide, Ollie's and more. And all of this can be found, um, or these free ask, 
uh, kiosks can be found across more than 1,300 different Walmarts, Sam's Clubs, and other grocery stores uh, nationwide. Yeah, and I would just I would just add here is again when we think about physical retail, that sort of product interaction and kind of multi sensory experience is what really sets it apart. And so finding new ways to engage consumers and and bring that product trial experience to life is is really critical here. Alongside some of the solutions that we've already talked about, what we're seeing is there is a along with some of the technology that's being brought to bear within the context of contactless interactions within these new uh, vending and sort of kiosk based experiences is a recognition that these solutions need to work for everyone, um, regardless of um, things like sight and um, ability to sort of, uh, you know, physically interact and, and things of that nature. And so what we're seeing is that there's uh, a desire to have new innovations that help all shoppers, regardless of um, you know who they are or, or how they might be abled to interact safely and intuitively with these systems. And I think, by and large, what we're seeing is that you know these solutions, while they might target sort of a niche consumer, ultimately are driving better experiences across the board. So here in response to really this growing health and hygiene concerns across all retail, um, PepsiCo created this touchless screen technology that can be controlled using gestures within quick service restaurants. Um, so it has that health and cleanliness aspect, but it's also a feature that has positive implications for more accessible ordering experiences for all guests. So without having to physically touch any screens, users can place their order pretty simply by moving their hands near the screen. The Jester interface uses computer vision and hand tracking technology, and it's actually able to sense where the customer is pointing to on the menu. And so a streamlined, easy to use uh, experience, customers were able to place their order within 40 seconds on average with this tech. Yeah, and I think alongside of that sort of customer experience that we're talking about here, obviously there's operational benefits. Staff doesn't necessarily have to be there to take an order. This helps ensure the accuracy of what is um, what is actually being ordered, and there's an opportunity to really sort of um, you know take those take those staff and deploy them in different ways within the context of the retail environment as well. We've talked a lot about different ways of utilizing digital display and the various benefits that that has within the context of retail. Now we're sort of stepping forward a little bit and thinking about the role that robotics and sort of physical automation plays um, within the retail environment. And, and here what we're seeing is that robotic staff, both front of house and back of house, so um, potentially on the shop floor, um, we've certainly seen a lot of instances of robots being deployed within the context of grocery stores and big box stores to take um, physical inventory on a consistent basis, um, help with cleaning, uh, et cetera. Within warehouses and pickup zones, we're seeing that um, they're there to sort of assist with picking items um, and delivering them in a fast and accurate way. Um, and again, the, recognizing that by outsourcing some of these time consuming tasks to fully automated solutions, there's an opportunity to then redeploy staff within the context of that physical retail environment. Yeah, and so for this example, we're looking at how luxury department store Saks Fifth Avenue is actually pairing robots with their, their employees. And they've developed a smart warehouse where dozens of autonomous robots are programmed to help their workers find items and fulfill online orders. So Saks partnered with GXO Logistics to operate both the robots and the facility. Um, and this all came about due to increased online orders and that fulfillment need that's risen there. So the facility couples uh, AI machine learning with this automated warehouse design that enables fulfillment center operations to boost both efficiency and speed up deliveries here. 
So the robots, which have been dubbed cobots because they do work um, alongside fellow SACS employees, are about four feet tall and they're controlled through display screens. Um, each of the robots are trained on SACS inventory and they can quickly compare incoming orders, product location, help guide employees to the location in the warehouse. And then from there, employees are able to select the item um, and then route them to the corresponding delivery bay. Yeah, I think this is quite interesting because obviously there is a lot of conversation in the marketplace right now around bringing in robotics and what that ultimately means for the workers that it's potentially replacing. Um, certainly in this case, there's still the need for human associates to sort of work alongside of that, but it raises a lot of questions in terms of operationally and human resourcing. Uh, thinking about how you redeploy, reskill um, associates so that they can then um, deliver on those high value engagements. Um, but again, it's it's sort of undeniable to see the need for these types of investments from a purely sort of operational efficiency point of view and what that means given the volume that Lauren talked about of, of online orders now sort of, you know, happening and, and being the way things are sort of seemingly headed in many instances. Within the context of retail, as well as food service, what we're seeing is that, um, again, there's a, there's a role to play in terms of thinking about how we move from traditional vending, which is um, been sort of along the lines of pre-prepared or pre-packaged meals and beverages, where we're sort of seeing things begin to happen is, you know, fully robotic systems that are then able to essentially take over the, the needs of a full service kitchen and prepare and even cook food for customers on demand. Um, some In some cases that is um, driven by specific menu items that are already that already exist, but it certainly opens the door for further personalization and customization down the road as well. So here we're highlighting the San Francisco based restaurant creator, which promises to make the freshest burger ever and it's all run robotically. So to start off, when a customer enters the store or restaurant, a human concierge actually is able to place each guest's order via a tablet. And then customers are able to watch along as the machine begins to assemble their meal. So while measuring sauces by the millimeter, cooking each burger to specifications and then packaging their order to go, um, customers are able to see all of this through um, a transparent window. The entire process takes about five minutes and eventually Creator is aiming to launch an app as well that would let um, customers actually customize exact ratios and ingredients um, and have that all be reflected in that process. Yeah, I mean, really, really starting to consider the future where you're pairing something like that PepsiCo example with something like this, where there's really that um, super high level of, of efficiency and personalization that's possible. I think for me, some of the interesting things is to consider, again, shrinking the footprint of, uh, you know, a food service offering and putting it in the context of retail or certainly within all of the um, travel occasions um, and being able to deliver something that's um, cost effective and fresh uh, without um, necessarily having to have a, a full service restaurant there. So it'll be interesting to see how these, um, how these technologies kind of stack up moving forward. Another interesting thing that we're seeing is, again, kind of combining a number of the trends that we've talked about previously in this, in what we're calling autofulfill footprints. And really, this is kind of considering the sort of customer facing side of um, the retail experience and then an automated back end where um, everything from um, pre populating dressing rooms in an automated fashion to um, you know, uh, imagining a future where customers walk into a store, they're making selections on a mobile device, perhaps, and then they're not actually selecting anything off of a shelf 
but everything is ready for them as they walk out that front door. Um, and considering what that means in terms of the configuration of retail and, and store experiences moving forward and the various ways that you can um, you know, add efficiencies and up that sort of level of um, experience within the context of uh, a physical store. And so this next example from JD.com is a robot run store that's combining both the online and in-store experience. So as one of China's largest retailers, JD.com opened two members only robotic shops under a new brand name, Ochama, um, located in the Netherlands. So it's merging that online ordering in-store pickup into one shopping format. Robots are able to both prepare the parcels um, and set up home delivery service. So members can place an order through the mobile app um, and can arrange to have it either picked up or delivered. And then within the store, members can um, observe as a fleet of robots, um, autonomous vehicles, robotic arms, sort, pick, transfer merchandise. At checkout, shoppers just simply scan a QR code, watch as their items are delivered, and then um, are able to have them appear on a conveyor belt. So an interesting example here for this. Yeah, what I think is what I think is interesting about this and now kind of considering this alongside the previous example of the restaurant is that in some ways the there was this sort of assumption that all of this is kind of magically happening in the background, um, whereas now part of the experience is actually seeing it happen. So having this sort of like observable um opportunity for customers to come in and kind of see all this automation as part of that experience. And so, um, again, some of it is just purely about efficiency and convenience, but there is a level of kind of like um, removing the veil and letting them see this all take place um, to help co-create that experience in different ways. And then finally, what we're touching on here is what we're calling high touch, small scale. And this is really sort of thinking about for us, what perhaps is the next level of vending solutions and mobile stores. Um, again, thinking about um, removing the need for, um, you know, needing all staff and maybe limiting the staff or having no staff on hand at all. Um, reducing the footprint of experiences um, in order to deliver tailored assortments that are either in unique uh, environments where customers are already spending their time. Again, sort of travel and commuting is, is one sort of level of this, but also considering how um, brands might show up within the context of uh, existing store footprints um, to drive brand awareness um, and also lead to incremental sales. And then again, sort of wrapping that all up with um, data that helps um, drive better decision-making around um, the offering at hand. And for this last trend, we wanted to highlight the on-demand automated store provider RoboMart. Mart. RoboMart, which is helping companies to meet consumers at their homes um, through its retailer platform dubbed a Market on Wheels. And so to place an order at a miniature on-demand market, consumers hail a stocked RoboMart vehicle using the company's app. Upon arrival, users just scan the app to unlock the van's doors. They're able to do product selections, add them um, to their digital cart, and then physically take them with them. Um, the contact experience, contactless experience uses our RFID based system within the actual vehicle that automatically charges each user's in-app account, kind of like that um, scan and go technology there for an instant checkout experience. And to be clear, this is definitely the most sort of future forward of any of the examples that we're kind of discussing here. But it's interesting to see this as sort of this specific example is perhaps the evolution of something like any of the 10 minute delivery services or something like um, an Uber experience where you're getting this sort of store on demand with a specific selection of items that you can choose from. So there's obviously um, upsell opportunities and things there. But alongside this, some of the other examples we see are, you know, Bring, being able to bring um, additional levels of service through remote um, 
remote video chat and, and other experiences that add to the level of convenience that's being delivered through what would traditionally have been just a vending machine uh, as well. So that takes us to the end. Um, this is uh, hopefully a great primer in terms of the overall uh, conversation that we're looking to have today. Some of the interesting things that we see happening within the marketplace already, the benefits and where potentially this is all heading. Um, we're excited to continue that conversation both in the chat and through the upcoming conversations that we will be having as part of this event as well. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, that was great context. And obviously there's a lot going on in that space. And all this research can be found in a new report uh, from PSFK around retail automation, uh, enhancing CX with frictionless retail automation. So, uh, which you can find on the PSFK site today. So let's um, think about the implications. Let's think about the um, how we can activate some of these themes, some of these trends that uh, Scott and Lauren have uncovered. I'm excited to uh, have a couple of experts with us today. So let's speak to them. We're excited to have Scott Finlow as our first expert speaker today. Scott is the Global Chief Marketing Officer of PepsiCo Food Service, where he leads brand development transformational products and equipment innovation, and customer marketing and industry insight efforts for the company's multi-billion dollar food service division. Scott, thanks for joining. And maybe you can just give us a little bit of context on your role and um, how that fits within, um, how food service fits within PepsiCo in general. Yeah. First of all, thanks for the opportunity, Scott. Great to see you. Uh, so. I lead food service marketing. Food service for perspective at PepsiCo is really where people are enjoying our convenient food and beverage product, products uh, away from home. So I think restaurants like Taco Bell or lodging partners like Marriott, or when you're at the airport or when you're going to Regal theaters to, to see a movie, or even when you're at school or work. So that's food service. And uh, to just continue the contextual setting, I think, as all of us have experienced, um, COVID has certainly created a ton of disruption broadly. And you know these um, contexts, these customers of ours have been pretty massively disrupted over the last couple of years. And you know, I think that's been a big driver of what has uh, led our work and led our focus and our purpose. And looking forward to talking more about some of that today. Awesome, that's great. And and as we kind of dive into the conversation here, recognizing that, thinking about that out of home experience, both within the context of commercial settings like restaurants, you mentioned movie theaters, talk about retail, um, there is a big conversation that's happening around how self serve and automation play a role. And particularly as we think about sort of that transactional side of things. Um, as you're sort of thinking about this with your kind of particular hat on, what are the ways you think restaurants and retailers should be thinking about taking advantage of a, I guess, mobile and sort of touchless um, interactions within the context of uh, or in the hands of consumers? Yeah. Well, I think to your point, consumers is where it all starts. And, uh, you know, one way I, I think we probably look at it is, you know, there were a series of things that were already at play, trends that were occurring, and COVID really was an accelerator of a lot of those trends. So you live in that world, you know it um, probably better than me. But, you know, I, I think what, what we've seen is almost a kind of a five-year leap in terms of the adoption of some of these technologies. Uh, and underneath that is the consumer expectation, you know, that we've lived through. So, I think convenience has become more important. I think safety uh, has become more important. Um, value has um, continued to evolve. And all of those are what I'd probably say the primary consumer drivers are. And you know, uh, we've all lived in the world of delivered food or, uh, or the world of Amazon. And that's, I think, forever changed the expectations that we as people have. Um, the other thing that's happened is our customers have 
navigated through COVID and through those consumer changes, as well as other challenges like supply chain and labor shortages and inflation, et cetera. And they've been massively disrupted as well. So, you know, at the convergence of that is the need for all of us, I think, to uh, first and foremost, I think, in answer to your question, you know, really lean into that consumer experience. And we think of it as in the context of where that operator is in the context of, you know, a quick serve restaurant is different than the context of a three day stay at lodging or a trip through an airport. Uh, and each one of those is important to understand as a consumer. Um, and I think then we're really leaning into what's the right way to try to remove tension, remove friction, and help make that whole experience better for that consumer, easier for that operator. And, and then also importantly, right, I'm here working for PepsiCo, ensure that it's leading to growth for our business and, uh, and a better experience with our brands as well. And, uh, you know, that's, well, it's not that easy to say, but it's easier to say than it is to do, right? So um, we've been hard at work at that. And I think what it's done is it's really helped us refocus on what matters most uh, to people and to operators. And, and that's been great, I think, is in terms of galvanizing us. Uh, and I'll give a couple of examples of things that we've done. Uh, so one is a platform we call SodaStream Professional. So we acquired that, uh, that business about three years ago. It's the world's largest sparkling beverage company by volume. And you probably know it as the in-home unit, which is awesome. Hopefully you're using it. Um, we launched and developed and launched a essentially an in um, a professional unit. We call it SodaStream Professional uh, for use in colleges, for use in workplace and other forms like that. Uh, what it does is it delivers on a personalized set of hydration um, needs for individuals. So you can customize your product, the temperature, the flavor, et cetera. But importantly, what we also did is we made a contactless experience and a digital experience. So there's an app that allows you to essentially set your favorites and then, uh, and then pour, save, meet your hydration goals, et cetera, uh, which is awesome. Secondarily, also allows you to save plastic bottles, which is also important. And what that app allows you to do is also connect between your in-home unit and this professional unit. So we're creating a connected ecosystem that helps people, importantly, with their hydration goals, uh, and also creates a, a better product experience for them that's personalized to their needs and makes it safer and makes it easier. Um, so that's one that you know we're excited about, and you know we've got big plans to continue. So another example of that is uh, as we work in the broader unattended space, uh, we're uh, tapping into emerging technologies like computer vision uh, and mobile payment and reinventing the vending machine. And uh, we've created something which is, think of it as a cooler, uh, a glass front cooler uh, that allows you to essentially authenticate, uh, open the door, choose a variety of different items, close the door and the transaction's closed. Uh, and that makes it easier for the user. Um, it, it creates greater uh, variety for the user. It's less labor for the operator. And we've seen great results on that. Um, so that's, we've seen 99% plus uh, accuracy in terms of the technology, which is always great. We're looking for proof points on that. And we've seen the user play it back that this is an easy experience. And we've seen you know, in the vicinity of 70% gains in terms of the, the revenues coming out of those pieces of equipment, because it is creating a better experience for the user. They're choosing more items because they can choose, they have more to choose from and it's easier for them. And, and there's also more premium items that we can offer in that. So great example of, of what you might call a win-win that leverages some of those technologies. It, it's interesting as you talk about this, because as you were sort of um, initially talking about this notion of kind of convenience, I think my mind automatically jumped to this idea that, yeah, self-serve and vending are these sort of like fast and efficient ways of doing things. But then as you're kind of adding in this layer of personalization to it, it's actually upping the experience for your consumer at the end of the day. And then to your point is delivering more opportunity for the sort of PepsiCo customers to benefit from that as well. Um, as you, 
as you're sort of putting these new solutions into the market, what some of the what some of the thinking and the things that you're you're considering as as you think about a the shopper or the consumer and the the customer the the sort of food service provider or theater or what have you yeah um you know it's a great question because in many cases our customers are um as sophisticated and as advanced as we are in exploring a lot of these territories. So as PepsiCo and food service, we're essentially a B to B to C um, player. And you know, it's always really important for us to partner with our customers to help them understand and meet those consumer needs that are constantly changing. One of the other, I'd say benefits or outcomes anyway of COVID has been, I think a closer relationship around the consumer. What is happening? How's that gonna play out? How's it gonna manifest? What are the implications to that? And uh, you know, we've responded, I think, uh, well with our customers and together with them to develop these solutions. So you know, in that example of that cooler, uh, we've very much developed that together with our customers and structured essentially the proposition uh, in partnership so that now that we have a proof of concept and we're looking to scale it, we've got a willing set of customers and partners who've been along the ride for us. Uh, and I'll give you another example, uh, which is kind of the next level on that. Uh, in conjunction with our uh, customer at the at Kansas University, they asked for help in essentially kind of reinventing the, um, the student convenience store. We partnered with a group called Newsstand um, that you may know. And we have essentially totally reimagined and re-delivered uh, you know, the convenience store on campus. So uh, reconfigured the assortment uh, and also made it a unattended or lightly attended experience. And similar to the Substring Professional example, uh, you know, we've created an app um, that where the students can essentially identify, authenticate, and then transact in that store in an easier way. Uh, and it gives them access to a variety of different media and ways to create value and rewards uh, in that way as well. And we've done a semester of uh, learning there and, uh, and learning's a key word. We, we know we need to optimize the assortment and get the products right. We know we need to optimize the consumer experience and build awareness and trial. We know we need to optimize the operator experience together with KU as well. All of those are great learnings. And anytime I think we're leaning into these technologies and these new models, um, you know, we're not gonna get it right the first time. And, and we haven't. Uh, and that speaks to, I think, one of the most important, call it, approaches that we're taking, strategies we're taking is start early, test and learn, uh, get smarter, do it with your customers and, uh, and figure out the path to scale and advantage, um, you know, by virtue of doing it that way. And I'll, I'll say right here, like there are some things we're testing, we're probably not going to continue with, right? We're going to learn that that isn't necessarily the right consumer experience, or we can't make the business work or whatever that may be. Uh, and that's what makes this an exciting and dynamic time uh, and space for us to be working in. Yeah, I feel like that's a really great lesson for folks out in the audience is to recognize that, you know, there is this, the test and learn approach is so critical for trying these things out because you don't know what's going to work and certain assumptions coming in might be proven wrong. And then, you know, you have to have the sort of mindset and process in place to respond to that and recognize that some things are going to succeed and then you can build from there. And then even with mistakes or missteps or what, what, what you ever you want to call them, there's an opportunity to learn, to learn from that as well. Um, I'm, I'm curious alongside of the kind of technology piece, it sounds like there's an opportunity um, to specifically garner a lot more sort of information or data about sort of transactions within these spaces and then use that as a sort of feedback loop to help further, you know, to your point, optimize some of the merchandise or perhaps learn more about sort of consumer tendencies. Is that, was that always a, a strategy kind of going in and, and how are you sort of uh, thinking about that 
moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the way, uh, you know, I'll reference something I said earlier, we're trying to go from a thinking about to some degree our um, customers as channels um, uh, to thinking them as contexts. Uh, and think about the intersection of, you know, when people are in that moment, what is that context? What's at play there? What are those, you know, consumer needs that, uh, that are happening in that moment? And I think that context can change depending on who's there or depending on the nature of that moment. Uh, it could be different in the morning than it is in the evening. It could be different on a Saturday than it is on a Tuesday. So I think the, you know, the long answer is, We've got a lot to learn to really understand people in those contexts. And I think that's going to lead us down into, um, you know, call it next generation and horizon deliverables that'll be more kind of loosely dynamic, I would say, uh, in terms of what is the offer, what's the value proposition. Some of the examples that you think about for food service that we all know and love really well, like the bundle. Uh, right, or the meal deal, or what have you. And um, our customers are super sophisticated when it comes to menus and optimizing menus, right? And what's the right value? And how do you grow? Uh, how do you grow check size? How are you driving incidents or attachment with things like fries or things like beverages? We've got to help them get much smarter about that in a digital first experience. And part of what matters in that conversation is to your point, the data, right? And obviously we've got to navigate together with our customers and we've got to make sure we're doing that in the right way with respect to things like privacy. And we're moving down that path and we're building capability in that path and we're leveraging uh, you know, new, call it capabilities that allow us to do that in a, you know, in a safe way where we can share data and learn together with our customers. But equally, there's call it the more qualitative side uh, of that as well, right? Which is just, understanding people in that context and understanding kind of the arc and shape of their their day in their lives and how that continues to evolve. I mean, all of us have a different life. We've all changed fundamentally in the last couple of years and, and that's just gonna continue. So I think it's a combination of what you might call the art and the science. And you know, for our folks who are working in consumer insights or category leadership or data sciences, you know, I think part of what we need to do is make sure we're um, breaking down our internal barriers and silos in that regard, uh, you know, to ensure that we're um, forming what I might call a holistic view of people versus, you know, a siloed view of different data points or insights. And you know, that's also a journey, as we like to say, but uh, we recognize we, uh, we got to get better at it and we're moving down that path together. Yeah, I love, I love that point how, I mean, obviously there's so much focus sometimes on the sort of the the data, let's call it just the, and sort of thinking about that existing in a vacuum and being the only sort of determiner. But um, I appreciate that you're sort of considering that within the broader context of the culture and the marketplace and what's what's happening there. So not to go too far down the road of being led by something. Um, but at the same time, I, I also love that sort of notion of how these solutions are so dynamic, have the potential to be dynamic within the context of recognizing the, the the flow within a day and how people sort of, you know, needs change and be able to respond to that. Um, super interesting. Um, you know, I think we, I think we touched on this all, already, but I'd just love to sort of ask this as a bit more of a specific question is, you know, the, this idea of convenience, I think traditionally has kind of been discussed as efficiency and speed. And as you think of that kind of evolving into the future, what, what do you feel convenience will, will, will mean or what will define convenience moving forward? Um, yeah, it's, I think we have a good sense for some things that are gonna continue and be more important, right? Uh, I'll probably, you know, one thing, I, I know this is kind of more of a retail forum, but I think all of us understand now that really there's no such thing as retail versus food service versus e-commerce. We're all living in an omni-channel world. And if there's one thing that should shape all of our thinking and planning going forward, it's how do we understand the notion of convenience across all of those versus 
uh, one world or another. Um, the second is, you know, I think one of the most fundamental shifts in convenience that's going to be maintained is the ability to get stuff delivered to you, right? And the delivery of food and beverages uh, over the last couple of years has obviously grown dramatically. And everything we're seeing in terms of those um, behaviors is that those are going to continue. And by the way, those are um, highest um, uh, amongst millennial uh, and multicultural youth, right? So that would suggest that, you know, these behaviors are, are going to be uh, continue to be led and you know those expect expectations of convenience are gonna continue so you know that's probably one of the biggest areas where we're focused on so we've stood up a team that we call the pepsico digital labs in food service it's, i guess it's the food service digital labs and you know part of what we also need to do is make sure we're bringing in the right talent new capabilities to deliver on um, in these areas and, uh, you know, that team is working closely on understanding, you know, what is that experience in the digital ordering? You know, I talked earlier about how our customers are so sophisticated in terms of the in-store menu experience or the drive-through experience, but most of our customers have more work to do together with us and more to learn to optimize that digital ordering experience, right? How do we ensure that the visibility of all of our products is right, that the variety is right. And that doesn't necessarily mean more versus less. It means having the right variety. And it probably means having the right variety in those contextual moments that could vary by individual and by day. And then what's the right value, which by the way, is uh, only the third most important component compared to the first two. But you know, we've got to make sure, especially in an inflationary environment, that we're uh, we're crafting the right value in the right way in that experience, and you know we've got a lot to learn from our ecom team in that regard, um, and we're working closely with our partners to ensure that as that convenience evolves, we're also you know delivering on the uh, call it overall need of uh, of people in that moment and doing it in a way that works for our customers and works for us as a business as well, given the you know the additional uh, elements in there. But the other, the other thing I'd say is it's not just convenience. This is the flip side of that as well, right? So we all want something convenient. We also have missed out on experiences, right? And we want the fun stuff as well. We want the indulgences. You know, we see things like frozen beverages grow in a double digits because that's a little experience that you can have delivered that helps. You know, we're going to be, um, you know, launching products and focused on creating experiences together with our customers that really try to go to kind of the next level in that regard as well. And we're looking at, call it emerging business models that, um, you know, that, that are at play like ghost kitchens and building virtual brands uh, together with those ghost kitchens and some of our customer partners too, to make sure that we're creating sort of new magical experiences for our brands uh, in that delivered convenient world as well. And, you know, we launched something called Pep's Place last year, which was the first ever fast beverage restaurant that, um, that did exactly that. And, uh, you know, we're gonna continue to, uh, to do more of that in the future. Awesome, yeah, I love, I mean, again, like that notion of convenience doesn't necessarily need to exist outside of the realm of experience as well. And if anything, it sort of maybe opens up moments of time to deliver on that experience in interesting ways, which I think is, again, it's no, it's no small order, but it's uh, a really interesting thing to aspire to, um, you know, for PepsiCo and for, you know, everybody who is listening in on this conversation. I think that's great. Um, just as a final question, um, you know, again, we've talked about a lot of different kind of uses of technology. Um, is there a specific technology or, or technology use case that you're kind of particularly bullish on at the moment as you're thinking about kind of 2022 and, and beyond? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm excited about a lot of technologies. And I, I think, look, we're... Uh, you know, we're testing in areas like gesture, we're exploring areas like voice, you know, we've, um, you know, we've worked in autonomous delivery years ago, we piloted that. And, you know, those are all examples of areas where we're going to continue to test and where I'm personally am excited and are starting to change the game. But, 
I think the the real answer um, for us and I think for anyone who's listening is it's really going to be the ability to start with that consumer, whoever your audience is, whoever you're trying to build your business and your brands with and fry and find the, you know, call it the, the mashup of relevant technologies that best enable um, you to deliver on whatever the right convenience is for you, whatever the right value is for you, whatever the right experience is for you and your business and your brands. And I don't know that it's one technology per se, uh, it's probably a basket of technologies. And what we wrestle with uh, as we um, look to call it embed those baskets of technologies is putting them all together in a way that is simple, that is easy, that is frictionless, uh, where it doesn't cost us too much or isn't too resource intensive, uh, you know, put those things together. And, you know, we're needing to look at new capabilities internally and new ways of working and breaking silos and, uh, you know, try to make sure that everyone is focused on delivering that and thinking and operating differently. Differently, like legacy behaviors are, uh, you know, we need to break some of those within our organization. And I think probably a lot of your audience is wrestling with those same things. And you know, I, I think the other reason I don't want to give a specific answer is two years from now we'll probably be dealing with some other technologies, right? And uh, that's going to be something that we have to figure out how we add to that basket versus throwing away what we're doing now and you know leaning into whatever that technology is in a couple of years. So. Those, I think, are the new ways of um, call it working and some of the challenges we face. But you know, as I said earlier, man, this is there's never been a more exciting time and a more dynamic time to be working in the user experience space or you know trying to figure out what people are looking for and how to deliver it. So it's fun, um, and I'm excited to be doing it. Awesome, yeah, I really I appreciate that sort of thought on just the kind of flexibility required now within the context of an organization to really internalize these things and figure out how best to bring, bring them to life. And so I think that's a really good lesson for everybody out there. Um, but Scott, thank you so much for sharing thoughts with me and the rest of the audience today. And, uh, you know, really appreciate it and, and good luck, uh, looking ahead in, in this year and sort of moving forward. So thanks. I oh, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Scott. Next, we're going to show a pre-recorded clip from an interview I had with Edith Volley earlier in the week. Edith is the Chief Sales and Marketing Officer at Clever, a next-gen logistics technology company producing robotics-based parcel terminals and innovative click and collect solutions for retailers, where she oversees global sales, partnership relations, as well as the project management and marketing teams. Hi, Edith. Hi, Piers. Yeah. So, you know, um, start off, you, I mean, you're speaking to your existing clients, you're speaking to your potential clients, you have North American retailers, global retailers. Um, what are some of the biggest uh, business challenges that they're facing today? Well, uh, today, um, some of our customers are still kind of building up their own omnichannel journey. Because it's even it's a wider thing than just automating something in store. It's a whole concept. Because due to COVID, I mean everybody moved online, and now the research shows and also the real life activity shows that uh, some of the customers too prefer to stay online. So it's a big question of uh, the retailers to how to build this kind of unified journey throughout your, or your online channels, your uh, in-store channels, and down to the delivery. So that's a big part. So it's a question of the supply chain and, and uh, also the in-store delivery. And then, of course, high volumes of parcels. And also, when you have high volumes of orders going out, you have high volumes of returns. So getting that, that part also right. I recently just heard... Uh, heard a big retailer uh, in, on a, in a conference and they said that uh, when, you, when you ship out a standard purchase, your touch points, I think there was like seven or eight, but when you deal with a return, there are 30 touch points. Then every touch point costs money. So getting that part efficient is a major thing. 
and yeah, yeah. the workforce uh, employees finding them uh, retail is not a really a popular sector uh, employees are getting older no uh, younger than not uh, younger people are not very interested in working retail so how do you supplement that how do you find solutions and how do you present yourself as a, as a, an employer uh, employee engagement is really really important so i would think briefly they these are the three most important things right now i mean uh, there's a lot of complications there um now your company looks at automation um and maybe you we, you can you can describe the services that your company does and then help us understand what are the key advantages of deploying automated solutions well clever provides uh, technology and software uh, for parcel handout handover uh, we do smart lockers or parcel lockers whichever way you want to call that and parts of robot, which are uh, basically uh, huge, uh, not even huge, but smarter parts of lockers. So what our technology does if, is that if you order something online, uh, the, that your order is placed in store in, in the locker or in the robot, and it turns the handover into a self-service, which means that the customer receives an SMS or, or an email, uh, goes to the shop, and then goes to the machine types in the code or scans the code and gets the parcel. And uh, it's, it normally takes like seconds. So uh, this is what we do. And uh, the automation of that part is, uh, I would say what the core word is efficiency. It saves time, money, and, and space. Uh, Time-wise, uh, if, you, if you think about a store employee, uh, how much time do they spend in, in having these parcels or in-store orders in putting them into the stock, then servicing customers in a, in a, behind the counter, going back to the stock, finding the parcel, and then kind of also uh, giving them out. So it, the average is, you know, 10, 15 minutes. But for a, for a robot, for a 402, it takes 10, 10 seconds to give out. And in a fast loading mode, when the employee puts the parcels in, it's seven seconds per parcel. So, uh, so it's it's fast. And, so, and, and there's obviously yes. the same advantages for the con consumer or the shopper has yes. all those advantages as well. Yeah, both ways. And yeah. uh, money-wise, um, well, which which part brings in more money for the retailer? If you have an employee who is engaged in giving out the parcels all day versus the employee who is engaging actual, in actual customer service, being on the floor, recommending the nice pair of jeans or the right size uh, t-shirt to you. So which one brings in more money? And of course, uh, space, meaning that um, uh, our, our biggest uh, robot contains uh, 1,200 parts and it just uh, in, a, in a small area. And it's smart, so it, it measures the parcels according to the height, so which means that it, they're neatly stacked. And this also means that you can, you can um, have lesser storage space, which means more retail space. And storage doesn't bring in money. Retail space does. So this is all uh, kind of down to efficiency. And that also, not just our solutions, but the automation, I think, is the goal. It's efficiency is the goal of automation, which in, ever, in whichever way you look at it. Interesting. What, um, what sort of feedback are you getting from your clients? Oh, they love it. I mean, um, it saves you time. I mean, think about it. If your average is uh, you order one, uh, one parcel per week, your yeah. average pickup time is 15 minutes per parcel. So multiply it by 52 and do the, do the math. And when you can down, downsize it to one minute or even 30 seconds, think about this time you save for yourself. And of course, that's, that's one part to saving time, especially, I mean, I love the, the grocery locker. I mean, I don't go to the store, I order things online and then I just grab up and take my stuff and go. I mean, saving myself 30 minutes because I like to, when I go to the shop, I just wander around, you know, what's new, what's yeah. there? <laughs> I just go in oh. and go out. <laughs> I mean, 
Well, I mean, you know, as you're a practitioner of kind of automation and robotics, um, where do you think this is all going to go? You know, um, we're really talking about these lockers and these smart lockers, and we see other kind of technologies such as sort of grab and go type technologies. Um, how do you think to see things evolving? I think there will always be uh, in store business. And then the grab and go, because people are different and cultures are different. I mean, uh, they always said that uh, television killed the radio. Well, it didn't. They still exist. They kind of coexist. And I think also that this is how we in-store and, and online shopping will be. Uh, but I will definitely think that there will be more functions. First of all, of course, the the return policy giving the, the now we mostly have the you pick up things as a customer, but then you can also do returns. I am a firm believer in open network. Uh, we all have a client SmartMy who does that, meaning that uh, also in Estonia, since we've been here for over 10 years, uh, we have parcel lockers everywhere, uh, all from different companies. So in, yes. in front of one store, we have like four different lockers and my guess is they're not always full so kind of consolidating that mm -hmm. having companies that you you buy a locker and then you rent it out uh, yeah. and, and this is something that's not really um the companies are not really open to that idea just yet but it will come it will be much more efficient Mm -hmm. And then, of course, just uh, evolution of a locker uh, itself, as we see also in Estonia with SMEs, that it's not uh, just handing over a, a parcel, something that you order online, but anything. I mean, we have car dealerships giving out car keys, uh, local governments giving out documents, and uh, book bookstores and libraries giving out books to the lockers. I mean, rental companies, anything. It's just it's just a means. Means to do something, give out something. It's not just a, something for a big uh, logistic company or a big retailer. Anyone can do that. And uh, yeah. kind of the, the uh, awareness will be growing. That's great. I mean, I'm excited to see those ideas kind of manifest across the globe here in the US <laughs> and everywhere else around the world. So, um, uh, Edith Valley of uh, the Chief Sales and Marketing Officer at Cleveron. I really appreciate your time today. Uh, thanks for the talk. Well, thanks for inviting me, Pierce. This event has been developed based on the themes presented in reports developed by the PSFK research team. These reports can be found in the PSFK IQ library. Visit PSFK today to find more than 400 innovation reports and thousands of case studies and data points. PSFK IQ where innovators turn for research. So thanks everybody for being part of this. Uh, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Lauren, uh, for supporting us and um, supporting this conversation today. I hope everybody enjoyed this talk. Uh, the research behind the webinar uh, can be found in a report that can be found on PSFK's site around retail automation. Just go to psfk.com backslash reports. Otherwise, um, I look forward to seeing you at one of these next events.